This is part four of the chapter five summary for the deep learning book, authored by Ian Goodfellow and others as presented on screen here. The focus of this section is on estimators, bias, and variance. The statistical concepts of estimators, bias, and variance will help us to formally characterize notions of generalization as well as over and underfitting. Bias and variance can be understood as arising as properties of estimators. One thing to note is that at this point in the book, we're taking the frequentist approach of statistics. We'll take a different approach in the next video the Bayesian approach. As you might expect, point estimation generally speaks to the attempt to make the best possible prediction of a value of interest. But the interesting part here is in asking what exactly is the object of interest. For machine learning applications, we're not only interested in estimating single values, but also large vectors of values. Pushing this thinking further, we're also interested in estimating functions, which makes sense if you think about a function as being a point in function space, something that can be approached. Function and point estimation are really the same thing, as generally to make a point estimate for a single value of interest, we're going to use a function of some sort, and so that will be our function estimator. The bias of an estimator is basically the average difference between the estimate and the true value. If there is no difference, then the estimator is unbiased. This principle can be applied to anything, with common applications being the estimation bias of the mean and the variance of probability distributions. While an unbiased estimator might be more desirable, there are some cases where a biased estimator isn't a bad thing. Just as we would compute variance for a given probability distribution, the variance and standard error of an estimator is also an important characteristic to have in mind. One thing to note is that while bias results from the comparison of an estimator against the process being estimated, an estimator's variance is purely a byproduct of the nature of the estimator itself, and isn't computed with reference to the process being estimated. That being said, if the bias is near zero, then minimal estimator variance is better because a given individual point estimate is more likely to be incorrect due to the degree that the variance is high, even if the expected value of the estimator is spot on. The standard error is the square root of the error, which allows for visualization of outcomes. For example, the heuristic exists for Gaussian distributions that 68% of outcomes will lie within plus or minus one standard error or standard deviation of the mean. In this machine learning context, we're often using data samples from an unknown distribution as opposed to referring to the source distribution itself, which also changes things. If a probability distribution is known, we would talk about standard deviation as the square root of variance. Because the distribution is not known, we refer to the square root of our variance estimator as standard error. That's because the variance of the mean across different sample sets is equivalent to the variance of the error between a given sample mean and the true distribution mean. So while the mean of the distribution may be whatever values or vectors, the distribution of the error in the estimate of the mean has the same shape. It's just translated to a different space, since all values have the true mean subtracted from them. Knowing they have the same shape, that's why those two distributions, the distribution of the mean and the error of the mean, have the same variance and standard deviation. So with the error distribution in mind, we refer to that as the standard error. One important relationship to know is that estimator variance decreases with the size of the sample set. You'll recall from a previous video that the objective of learning is to reduce the training error for a given task on a given data set, but also to formulate a model that minimizes the difference between test error and training error. This strategy is similarly described in terms of bias and variance. Having a zero bias for your estimator is like having zero training error. You then want to minimize variance so that instead of being able to say an estimator is right on average, you can say more confidently for any loan estimate that it is near to the correct value. Naturally, this double motivation scenario inevitably leads to the question of defining what provides better outcomes if you can only choose one of the parameters. The solution is to create a single quantitative measure and use that to evaluate different estimators. In our case, that is the mean squared error, or MSE. This is a strategy I discussed in the past on the topic of linear algebra. This chart extends the analogy I mentioned earlier, showing how bias tends to decrease uh, with model capacity and variance tends to increase. As I had mentioned, this creates a different perspective or explanation for the U-shaped generalization error curve, in addition to the interpretation of training and test error changing. An estimator is described as consistent if the larger the sample the size, the greater its estimate accuracy. This is expressed using the equation presented here where p limit means the limit of the probability. The second equation shown here is the same thing but expressed using probability notation. 
it shows that as the sample size approaches infinity, a consistent estimator would be characterized by the probability of the estimate error being greater than any non-zero threshold value becoming zero. In our context, this means we can expect our estimator to become less and less biased as the data sample grows. It should be noted, though, that the opposite is not always true. That is to say, there may be asymptotically unbiased models, but they are not guaranteed to be consistent. Being more mathematically precise, this form of consistency shown here is called weak consistency. Weak consistency is differentiated from other forms of consistency, but this is pretty nuanced statistical theory that I'm not including in this video. At this point in the text, multiple estimators have been presented, but we don't have a methodology for developing them for a new distribution other than guessing. We need some principles from which we can have a strategic approach to developing estimator functions. Maximum likelihood estimation is the most common such principle. The idea of this principle is that if we sampled a particular data set from a distribution, then that set must have been the most likely set of that size that could be drawn from that distribution. That's why it was sampled, because it was the most likely. With that idea, the probability distribution that we use as an estimator for the true distribution should maximize the probability of that set occurring. In this example, we're using the model probability, p model, as a variable to stand in for some probability function that provides the probability of the object x taking a given value. And this function is defined by the parameters grouped into theta, a vector. Accordingly, we start off by creating a formulation to seek out the parameters of a theta vector that maximize the product of the probabilities arising from our undetermined function. So that's the joint probability of achieving the set that we have sampled. Given the nature of a log function, Implementing the log function doesn't change which theta would maximize the formulation. Doing that allows us to switch from multiplication to addition on the basis of the rules for manipulation of logarithm terms, which can avoid problems like underflow. Similarly, the expression can be linearly scaled by any number, and the argmax outcome remains unchanged, so we can divide the expression by m. Summing over m terms and dividing by m terms simplifies to computing the expected value of that term in question. Reaching this point, a different perspective on the objective becomes possible. We started off with the theory that constructing a probability distribution so as to maximize the probability of the sample set would also create a distribution similar to the true unknown distribution. This is confirmed when you see that maximizing the term we have constructed is equivalent to minimizing the overall KL divergence between the sample distribution and the true distribution. And if you recall, the KL divergence provides a measure of dissimilarity between two distributions. So it makes sense that this approach would be effective since it's minimizing the KL divergence. And again, the minimization perspective is the one usually taken in machine learning. So this perspective about minimizing KL divergence can be more popular. The maximum likelihood estimator can be generalized to conditional probabilities. This is a very common application in supervised learning schemes. The text provides an example of how it is that the linear regression algorithm can be understood as a maximum likelihood estimation of the parameter for a function describing the conditional distribution of outputs for a given input. And this analysis shows that the solution using these equations is equivalent to the linear regression algorithm developed previously. This can be found on page 131. The maximum likelihood approach is often the preferred means of creating an estimator for machine learning because of its consistency and efficiency. The method is consistent when these two conditions are true. First of all, the true unknown distribution must be a member of the family of distributions for which a function is being estimated. For example, if you are seeking to determine a parameter for a normal distribution to fit the data, but in fact the data is uniformly distributed, then the process won't be consistent. Secondly, consistency is only assured if the true distribution is described by only one particular set of parameters within that distribution family. If more than one parameterization would yield the same distribution outcome, then the method can't be assured to provide the parameterization corresponding to the true distribution. Principles other than the maximum likelihood estimation principle exist, and most are also consistent, but the difference lies in statistical efficiency. That refers to the possibility that, while potentially consistent as the sample size grows to infinity, different estimators will have better or worse estimates for a given sample size, which makes a practical difference. This is often measured using the mean squared error, or MSE method for which the maximum likelihood estimator is proven to be superior for larger values of m. That wraps up this video. In the next one, we'll be moving on to Bayesian statistics. Thanks for watching, and take care.